Huh. Adnan Saeed from the Serial Podcast is released from jail. Nah, that's way too controversial for me. Hello? Hey, buddy. Thanks, Devin. And I mean that. Thank you for having me be the sacrificial lamb talking about a wildly controversial subject that will almost certainly result in irrational attacks on me. I'm doubling my fee, Devin. Check the invoice. Adnan Syed, the subject of the most popular podcast of all time, is a free man. The stunning reversal in the case that inspired the serial podcast. Officials have dropped all charges against Adnan Syed after he spent 23 years in prison. Adnan Syed is a free man. He walked out of a Baltimore courthouse today. Syed was convicted of murdering Hay Min Lee in 1999. This doesn't mean that he's necessarily innocent, but the state's attorney for Baltimore, Marilyn Mosby, has just announced that the state is dropping all charges against Syed. This morning, I instructed my office to dismiss the criminal case against Adnan Saeed following the completion of a second round of touch DNA testing of items that were never tested before. Adnan Syed's case was featured on the first season of the podcast Serial, which became a true crime sensation. The podcast was downloaded over 100 million times. Serial inspired other podcasts about the case, several documentaries, and multiple criminal appeals of Syed's sentence. This case is also incredibly controversial, with some people convinced that Syed is absolutely innocent. I'm innocent, Red. Just like everybody else here. And others equally convinced that he's an unrepentant murderer. You guys are pathetic. You're idolizing a murderer. In this episode, we're going to explain how we got to the point of Syed walking free after 23 years. But we are not going to try and solve the case. In other words, we're doing the characteristic legal eagle thing, which is annoy everyone who has a strong opinion. It's the legal eagle brand. Let's go back to 1999. In 1999, Hay Min Lee was an honor student at Woodlawn High School in Baltimore County, Maryland. On January 23rd of that year, when she was 18 years old, Lee disappeared after leaving school. There were no witnesses to her disappearance. One month later, her body was found at Leakett Park. Police determined that she had been strangled to death, and they eventually arrested Adnan Syed, Lee's 17-year-old ex-boyfriend, and charged him with murder. Syed was also an honor student, but during the trial, prosecutors made hundreds of references to Adnan's race and religion, introducing him to the jury by saying, the defendant is of Pakistani background, he's a Muslim. Now this was used to explain the religious and familial tensions that ultimately led to the breakup between Lee and Syed, and hence a motive to kill. But it's not a great look. What we've got here is Failure to communicate. At the time of trial, there was no DNA evidence linking Syed to the murder. Instead, the state relied mostly on the testimony of Jay Wilds, a friend of Syed's who was a known drug dealer. Wilds was a year older than Lee and Syed, and had graduated the year before. He eventually told the police that Syed killed Lee. Wilds allegedly drove to the park where he watched Syed bury Lee's body. Here's the basic version of events the prosecution presented during the trial. Around lunchtime on the day Lee disappeared, Syed tells Wilds that he's going to kill Lee. Wilds then borrows Syed's car and cell phone on the condition that Wilds drops Syed off at school, which he does. Wilds then goes to his friend Jen Pusateri's house to hang out. Syed has a free period and then gets to his psychology class late at 1.27 p.m. That class ends at 2.15 p.m. And according to Syed, he goes to track practice later from 3.30 to 4.30 or 5. Up to this point, the timelines from Syed and Wilds are largely similar, but this is also where they start to diverge substantially. And it's this gap in time, 2.15 to 3.30, that the prosecution focuses on as the time Syed kills Lee. According to Wilds, Syed calls him at some point in the afternoon, asking Wilds to pick him up later. Not hearing anything further from Syed, Wilds eventually leaves Pusateri's house and drives to his friend Jeff's house. Jeff wasn't home, and as Wilds is leaving the neighborhood, he gets a call from Syed asking him to meet at Best Buy. It's notable that Wilds believed this call was around 3.30 or so. Both he and Pusateri remember Wilds leaving her house around 3.30. But the prosecution used a cell phone log to argue that this phone call from Syed to Wilds actually happened at 2.36. Remember, it is important to the prosecution that the murder happened sometime between 2.15 and 3.30. According to Wilds, he meets Syed at the Best Buy parking lot, where Syed shows him Lee's body in the trunk of her own car. 
They then ditch Lee's car at the I-70 park and ride, and after buying some marijuana, Wilds drops Syed off at track practice. Wilds later picks Syed up from track practice. Syed retrieves Lee's car, and ultimately, they end up at Leakin Park. Wilds also testifies that Syed's phone received two phone calls while Syed was digging a hole for Lee's body. The cell phone records showed two incoming phone calls at 7.09 and 7.16 on the day Lee disappeared. The state then called an expert from AT&T who testified that the cell towers where the calls were received were connected with cell sites around Leakin Park. Wilds' version of events was somewhat backed up by Pusateri. She confirms that Wilds was at her house until about 3.30. She also told police that when she tried to call Wilds on Syed's phone that day, someone else answered and told her Wilds was busy. She also said that Wilds later told her he saw Lee's body at the Best Buy and that Syed strangled Lee because Lee broke Syed's heart. Now something is worth saying at this point. This has been a quick summary and is not intended to capture all the issues identified by people scrutinizing this case. Fans of Serial are probably tearing their hair out right now. I'm mad as hell! I'm not gonna take it anymore! For one thing, the version of events Wilds testified to at trial was similar to but not altogether consistent with his two interviews with police. Wilds himself later told an interviewer from The Intercept that he was terrified of going to prison for dealing marijuana to high school students, and he was also afraid it would somehow implicate his family since he based his operations out of his grandmother's house. Originally, Pusateri told police that she didn't know anything about what happened. Years later, Pusateri would say that Wilds was always very convincing. He was a good storyteller. He would make you believe your shirt was green if it was blue. When confronted with the many versions of Wilde's story, including one where he sees Lee's body behind some row houses rather than the Best Buy, Pusateri concluded that Jay obviously picks and chooses what he tells, and at this point, it's created such a mess. Wilde's agreed to cooperate with the police and was actually charged as an accessory after the fact. He told the jury that the crime was premeditated, that he heard Syed saying, I'm going to kill that bitch, just hours before she disappeared. He also testified that Syed bragged about the murder when he showed Wilds the body, saying, I killed someone with my bare hands. Syed's defense was that he couldn't have committed the murder. He went to school, he went to track practice, and then he went to pray at his mosque with his father for Ramadan. Needless to say, a jury found him guilty of murder, robbery, kidnapping, and false imprisonment, and he was sentenced to life in prison. The Serial Podcast presented a new witness, a woman who allegedly saw Syed at the library between 2.30 and 2.40 on the day Lee went missing. Remember, the prosecution argued that the murder had to have happened between 2.15 and 3.30 or so. The witness, Asia McLean, said that she tried to testify at Syed's trial, but that his lawyer, Maria Gutierrez, never contacted her. It's notable that Gutierrez was disbarred in 2001 after a series of client complaints. The podcast also questioned the reliability of the cell phone tower records and revealed that physical evidence gathered in 1999 was never tested for Mr. Syed's DNA. In 2015, momentum from Serial helped Syed file an appeal with new lawyers. A state court granted Syed a new trial after his lawyers showed that Gutierrez had been grossly negligent for not calling McLean as an alibi witness. The lawyers also questioned the reliability of the cell tower evidence. Now, Gutierrez had died in 2007, so she was unable to testify about why she didn't investigate McLean. In 2018, the Maryland Court of Special Appeals upheld the decision to grant Syed a new trial and vacated his conviction on the grounds that he received inadequate legal assistance. Now, didn't I tell you the next time you appear in my courtroom that you dress appropriately? You were serious about that? The state then appealed to Maryland's highest court, the Court of Appeals. Let's take a step back. What did Adnan Syed have to prove to get a new trial? Syed's legal team raised a claim called ineffective assistance of counsel in violation of the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Syed's defense team presented one issue on appeal, that he was denied effective assistance of counsel because Gutierrez failed to even interview the alibi witness. An alibi witness is a defendant's claim that he or she was at another place at the time when the alleged crime was committed. In Strickland v. Washington, the U.S. Supreme Court outlined a two-pronged test for determining whether a criminal defendant has received ineffective assistance of counsel. The defendant must first prove that the trial counsel's performance was deficient. If the lawyer's performance was deficient, then the defendant has to prove that he suffered actual prejudice by trial counsel's deficiency. 
In other words, the defendant has to demonstrate that if not for his counsel's bad performance, there was a substantial probability that the jury would not have convicted the defendant. The Maryland Court of Appeals ruled against Syed in a 4-3 decision that overturned the lower court ruling. The Court of Appeals first held that under the deficient performance prong of Strickland v. Washington, at a minimum, Syed's trial counsel had a duty to contact a potential alibi witness to investigate or explore that person's background as a potential as an alibi witness. The American Bar Association's standard for defense counsel required them to conduct a prompt investigation of the circumstances of the case and explore all avenues leading to facts relevant to the merits of the case and the penalty in the event of conviction. The investigation should include efforts to secure information in the possession of the prosecution and law enforcement authorities. Gutierrez's failure to contact an alibi witness constituted deficient performance under the first prong of the Strickland test. The second prong of the Strickland test asks whether trial counsel's deficient performance resulted in prejudice. To show prejudice, a defendant has to show that there is a reasonable probability that but for counsel's unprofessional errors, the result of the proceeding would have been different. Under this standard, a defendant must demonstrate either one, a reasonable probability that, but for counsel's unprofessional errors, the result of the proceeding would have been different, or two, that the result of the proceeding was fundamentally unfair or unreliable. The key question in this analysis is what constitutes reasonable probability? The Supreme Court described it as a probability sufficient to undermine confidence in the outcome. Maryland courts interpret reasonable probability to mean that there was a substantial or significant possibility that the verdict of the trier of fact would have been affected. A court does not presume that the outcome of a trial would have been different just because the lawyer's performance was deficient. And that is what doomed Syed's appeal. The court said that even if McLean's statements about seeing Syed in the library was true, her alibi does little more than call into question the time that the state claimed Miss Lee was killed and does nothing to rebut the evidence establishing Mr. Syed's motive and opportunity to kill Miss Lee. Thus, the jury could have disbelieved that Mr. Syed killed Miss Lee by 2.36 p.m., as the state's timeline suggested, yet still believed that Mr. Syed had the opportunity to kill Miss Lee after 2.40 p.m. Miss McLean's testimony, according to her affidavit, failed to account for Mr. Syed's whereabouts after 2.40 p.m. on January 13, 1999. Likewise, Mr. Syed's statements to the police failed to account for his whereabouts after 2.15 p.m. when school let out. Therefore, even if the alibi testimony had been admitted into evidence, it could not have affected the outcome of the case because that evidence did not negate Mr. Syed's criminal agency. So although the court agreed that Gutierrez's representation was deficient because she had failed to investigate an alibi witness, the majority concluded that Syed was not prejudiced by Gutierrez's mistakes. The court found that the jury would have convicted him based on Wilde's testimony and the cell tower records. As a result, Syed did not get a new trial. But that's not the end of the story. Syed's claims were given new life in 2020 after a new Maryland law gave prosecutors the discretion to modify the sentences of offenders who were under 18 at the time of their crimes if they had served at least 20 years in prison. In 2021, Baltimore prosecutors conducted an investigation into the circumstances of Syed's conviction with the help of Syed's lawyers. In March of 2022, Baltimore prosecutors agreed to new DNA testing, saying that it was merited because of advances in genetic science. The prosecutor agreed to the defense request for touch DNA testing, which was not available at the time of Syed's trial. In September, prosecutors filed a motion to vacate Syed's conviction. Mosby accused the state attorney general's office of Brady violations. Now, the Brady rule requires prosecutors to disclose materially exculpatory evidence in the government's possession to the defense. Basically, this means that the prosecution has to tell the defendant about any evidence that would potentially negate a defendant's guilt, that would reduce a defendant's potential sentence, or evidence going to the credibility of a witness. The prosecutor's motion said that prosecutors on the case decades ago knew that there was another suspect who threatened to kill Lee and neglected to disclose that information to defense attorneys. Mosby asked that Syed be granted a new trial at a minimum and released on his own personal recognizance. A local judge agreed and Syed was freed. Mosby's office then had 30 days to complete its review. 
Maryland Attorney General Brian Frosch released a statement disputing Mosby's allegations. Among the other serious problems with the motion to vacate, the allegations related to Brady violations are incorrect. Neither state's attorney Mosby nor anyone from her office bothered to consult with either the assistant state's attorney who prosecuted the case or with anyone in my office regarding those alleged violations. The file in this case was made available on several occasions to the defense. The friction between Mosby and Frosch brings up another point. Why would Mosby exonerate Syed now? Maryland's Supreme Court denied Syed's appeal and the US Supreme Court refused to hear the case. That would have finalized his conviction. Activists on both sides of the Syed case think that the decision was politically motivated. Here's to Ray McKesson, who champions Syed's innocence, pointing out that Mosby has some credibility issues of her own. See, here's the thing. Mosby had the new DNA evidence a la Adnan for a while now. She didn't just get it yesterday. Why was the announcement yesterday? She waited to announce to drown out coverage of her own indictment. And here's a blog post from the Manhattan Institute, which argues against the reforms Mosby tried to enact and blames her for the city's skyrocketing murder rate. With the city reeling and her reputation in tatters, the safest exit strategy for Mosby would have been to wind down her role quietly, hoping that nobody noticed as she skulked off to face her federal charges. Instead, Mosby is reinforcing her deprosecution credentials, executing on a plan to free Adnan Syed, convicted of killing a teenage girl. Their point? Well, Marilyn Mosby was a lame duck. You're despicable. She was one of the first prosecutors elected on a platform of decarceration. And that was in 2014. In 2022, Baltimoreans did not reelect Mosby. The federal government indicted Mosby on two counts of perjury and two counts of making false statements on a loan application. The perjury counts involve Mosby allegedly falsely claiming a COVID-19 hardship on applications to withdraw $90,000 from her retirement account. The tax-free withdrawal option was one of the benefits of the CARES Act. Now, the prosecutor's investigation is complete. Mosby looked at three main issues, DNA, alternate suspects, and cell phone evidence. Mosby said her office received DNA testing on Lee's skirt, nylons, jacket, and shoes. Those items include skirt, pantyhose, shoes, and jacket of Miss Heyman Lee. Forensic scientists could not recover any DNA from the first three, but they did find a DNA mixture of multiple contributors on Lee's shoes. Mosby said, most compellingly, Adnan Syed's DNA was excluded. And most compellingly, Adnan Syed, his DNA was excluded. Trace level male DNA was detected on Lee's right fingernail swabs, the right fingernail clipper swabs, and the victim's shirt swabs. The swabs from the right fingernail and shirt were then analyzed, but no useful typing results were obtained from this analysis. Another shirt swab and the right hand fingernail clippings were not analyzed because it was determined that the amount of male DNA was so minimal it would not likely produce any results. With respect to Brady material on alternate suspects, the prosecutor's office said they found a separate document from the original trial file in which a different person relayed information that can be viewed as a motive for the same suspect to harm the victim. This information about the threat and motives to harm could have provided a basis for the defense and was not disclosed to the trial nor the post-conviction defense counsel. Mosby said that new information also revealed that one of the suspects was convicted of attacking a woman in her vehicle and that one of the suspects was convicted of engaging in serial rape and sexual assault. The investigators found out that Lee's car was located right behind the house of one of this suspect's family members. Some of this information was available at the time of trial. Some of the events occurred after the trial, according to the news release. As for the cell phone tower data, the prosecutors found that based on the cellular technology at the time of the incident in this case, it was possible that an incoming call could be recorded at the last registered tower sector and not the current one when the signal is sent across multiple towers within an area. The investigative team said that two other experts verified this conclusion. Mosby said that the investigation into Lee's murder continues, but she declined to offer any details. Presumably, the investigators will look at the possible involvement of two alternative suspects other than Syed. We don't know if the suspects are involved individually or involved together. According to the trial file, one of these suspects said he would make her disappear, he would kill her, referring to Miss Lee. Mosby characterized Syed's conviction as a miscarriage of justice. 
As the administrator of the criminal justice system, it's my duty to ensure that justice is not delayed, justice is never denied, but justice be done. Lee's family does not agree that justice was done. They've expressed concerns about why the Baltimore County Prosecutor's Office abruptly exonerated Syed after insisting on his guilt for decades. They're very sad. I think they feel very hopeless about any future justice being brought. The family also felt excluded from the prosecutor's decision making, stating that they were not informed about the progress of the investigation. On September 29th, Lee's family filed a motion opposing Syed's release, asking a court to halt the legal proceedings to address alleged violations of a state victim's rights law. Lee's family says that prosecutors didn't let them know that they intended to vacate Syed's sentence. The motion says that two days after prosecutors filed the motion to vacate, there was a meeting between prosecutors and Syed's attorneys. The family says they were not notified of the proceeding and were later informed an in-person hearing was scheduled for the next business day, leaving them with no opportunity to attend or be heard. Young Lee, who is Hay's brother, filed a motion on the same day as the September hearing, stating he didn't have enough notice to attend. The court went into recess for about 30 minutes while a call was hastily arranged for Young Lee to express his confusion. The court hasn't ruled on the family's motion, but it's unlikely to change the outcome. Lee's family put out a statement saying, all this family ever wanted was answers and a voice. Today's actions robbed them of both. And now, let me burst the true crime bubble. Lee's family believes in Syed's guilt and they have good reasons to. There is a glaring hole in the defense argument that McLean provided Syed with a rock solid alibi. In his accounts of where he went on the day Lee was killed, Syed never said that he was at the Woodlawn Public Library. McLean's testimony conflicted with Syed's accounts of his whereabouts that day, which of course made Gutierrez's client look untruthful. Gutierrez got into trouble with the bar on other matters, but that doesn't mean that she was wrong not to reach out to McLean. There's another problem with the Adnan was at the library alibi. It doesn't account for his whereabouts after about 2.40 p.m. The state always asserted that Lee was killed between 2.15 p.m. and 2.45 p.m., but they don't know for sure. Syed still had time to leave the library, strangle Lee, get Wilds' help with the body, and then head back to track practice by early evening. There's yet another angle to the McLean story. How do we know she's telling the truth? The Attorney General's office said that two of McLean's classmates contacted them with allegations that she made the story up. The witnesses, who are sisters, remember talking with McLean about it in their co-op class. And I quote, both my sister and I, more so my sister, argued with Asia about how serious this situation was. She just said that it wouldn't hurt anything, that if he was truly guilty, then he would be convicted. I'm not sure what can come of this information, but I felt I had to let someone know. Lots of people will say that these two classmates who remain anonymous must be the liars. But that's the problem. People tend to draw inferences about who is telling the truth based on which side they're rooting for. McLean apparently wasn't so sure that her alibi meant Syed was innocent. It seems even McLean knew that if she saw Syed in the library, it did not mean he wouldn't have had time to kill Lee. She wrote to him when he first went to prison, saying, if you are innocent, I will do my best to help you. But if you're not, only God can help you. McLean later published a book called Confessions of a Serial Alibi. The Attorney General's office pushed back against Mosby's claim that the McLean information was withheld from the defense. Among the other serious problems with the motion to vacate, the allegations related to Brady violations are incorrect, the office said in a news release issued after the hearing. Neither State's Attorney Mosby nor anyone else from her office bothered to consult with either the Assistant State's Attorney who prosecuted the case or with anyone in my office regarding these alleged violations. The file in this case was made available on several occasions to the defense. Moreover, it's worth pointing out that the inconsistencies in Wilds' accounts of what happened that day were actually addressed head on by the prosecution during trial. And then there's the new touch DNA evidence. It revealed that there were multiple DNA contributors on Lee's shoe, but none of them Syed. So what does that mean? Well, honestly, not a lot. It could mean Syed never touched the shoe, or it could mean Syed did touch the shoe, but not enough or in the right way to transfer his DNA onto it. By itself, it really doesn't mean much. So although Adnan Syed has been exonerated by the state of Maryland, the question remains, who killed Heyman Lee back in January of 1999? Was it one suspect 
or two people working in concert? Did investigators know their names during Syed's trial in 2000? Sources say that Baltimore County prosecutors are mostly considering old suspects. Of course, there was presumably a reason that these suspects weren't pursued in the original case. What were those reasons? And what did the Maryland Attorney General's office know about them? And perhaps most importantly, is Mosby able to test those suspects' DNA? Only time will tell, but Syed will be spending that time a free man. Oh, uh, well, yeah, now that Adnan is out of jail, he'll probably want a delicious home-cooked meal delivered straight to his door, which you can get with today's sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a great way to eat delicious fresh food while still being healthy. In fact, HelloFresh has a whole variety of calorie smart, carb smart, pescatarian, and veggie options, so you can customize it how you like too. HelloFresh delivers fresh quality produce from the farm to your door in less than a week, so you can enjoy seasonal favorites like cowboy turkey and black bean chili, mushroom ravioli with kale and walnuts, or sweet corn and green pepper chowder. Now, I'm a do-it-yourself person, and I have to say, I was initially pretty skeptical about HelloFresh. I'm a pretty good cook, so I didn't think that I needed the help, but I actually loved it. Even for an experienced cook, HelloFresh delivers new ingredients and recipes that I'd never try on my own. They usually keep everyone's favorite meals and then rotate new ones in all the time. In fact, I usually increase the size of my HelloFresh servings so I can enjoy leftovers for lunches. And of course, everything was delivered straight to my door, so I didn't have to do any shopping. The produce actually gets to you faster than in a grocery store, so it arrives at peak freshness and flavor. And it's also super easy to save time. HelloFresh cuts out the meal planning and prep, so the recipes only take 20 to 30 minutes to cook, literally less time to cook than it would normally take me to do the shopping. And it's also incredibly sustainable. Since the ingredients are pre-portioned, there's less prep and less wasted food. The packaging is almost entirely made from recyclable or already recycled content. And HelloFresh's carbon footprint is actually 25% lower than that of meals made from store-bought groceries. And of course, it's 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant. So if you'd like to try HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com and use the code LegalEagle60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Yes, you can actually get 60% off plus free shipping by clicking on the link that's on screen right now or down in the description. So go to HelloFresh.com and use the code LegalEagle60 or just click on the link below. Plus, clicking on that link really helps out this channel. And after that, click on this playlist over here for more Legal Eagle or I'll see you in court.